A recent study found that children spend more time with electronic media than they do in any other activity aside from sleep. More than anything else, aside, more than eating, more than school, more than playing outside, more than character development, more than anything else aside from sleep. Now, children might be getting more, slightly more media than sleep. Young people, on the other hand, are getting more time in electronic media than any other activity, period, including sleep more time on their phones or in media of some sort than they are sleeping. The current average runs about 8 to 12 hours per day for most young people in some form of media, with heavy users running as much as 18 hours per day in media use. Uh, 75 to, actually in New Zealand here, it's closer to 80% of children of age 0 to 8 have access to or even own a smartphone with nearly 40% of children using tablets. Shocking statistics. We could spend a lot of time on how much media children are using. The point here, though, is that media has taken this generation by storm. We are using, I mean, maybe you're saying, as you see these stats, you're like, you know what, my children don't use that much media. I hope that's the case. But you'll probably agree that even if your children aren't using eight hours a day, they're more, using more media now than your average child did 30 years ago, right? <laughs> we weren't dealing with these media issues 30 years ago. Times have changed. Whether they're using one hour or 12 hours, things are different. How is it in, um, impacting children? We don't have to spend time on shocking statistics to know that we're immersed in it like never before. How is it affecting us? You know, I do find it interesting, as a bit of an aside, that never in history have we been so supposedly connected, and yet our social lives are shallower than ever. Or what about the irony that never have we had so much to grab our attention while attention deficit disorders are on the rise? Or the fact that kids have access to more information than ever in history while test scores and school performance are on the decline. What gives? Eagerly, we're snapping up these next and greatest gadgets and we consider them a help and advancement in our lives. We pass them on to our children and consider them the greatest invention of babysitting in the millennium. We blindly assume that the tech companies must have assessed the effects of these fancy toys and therefore they won't hurt our children. And besides, think of all the educational value Think of how much they can learn, but is it that simple? Is there a cost? Are there reasons for concern? What really are the side effects of this new lifestyle that we're leading? Perhaps we should take a step back and just consider whether or not there are side effects. What is it actually doing so that we can make an informed decision? I'm not here saying that we're going to throw all the media out. I'm not saying we're going to use more media. I'm just saying we need to look at the research and make an informed decision decision. In reality, we have been grossly uninformed, especially when you look at the, the market out there. Rarely, if ever, are the effects considered by those selling the technology, because it would not be in their best interest. And I agree that electronics and technology can be very beneficial in our lives. I'm here using a PowerPoint and a clicker. I have a smartphone. We have a projector here. These are useful tools in our lives. But I think it's time, we did two things. We need to stop the free-for-all and take an informed approach to our use of media, but we also need to make a differentiation, a distinction, sorry, between what age media is being used. What is good for an adult might not be good for an eight-year-old. And we, again, we just need to look at what the effects are. I like to look at it from this perspective. We have benefits on one side, we have damages on the other. There are benefits of technology and media, and yet there are also damages. Will the benefits outweigh the damages, or will the damages outweigh the benefits? Some of the benefits often named for media are educational value for literacy and numeracy, social benefits, hand-eye coordination, helping creativity, can teach good values. These are often cited as benefits of media. And yes, they can be, although I would maybe ask the question, how did children learn these things before media was invented? <laughs> are, are there other ways for them to learn these things? Definitely are. So when you have something that has some side effects, 
and two ways to learn something, and the one way has side effects, maybe you want to abandon that one method of using something. So anyway, these are some of the benefits. Let's look at some of the damages, though. We're going to spend more time on that for sure. Some points to consider as we look at the principle of that we have been uninformed. Let's consider our first point, and that is the addiction factor. Media has an unbelievably strong addicting power, and this can be a benefit or it could certainly be a negative. Let's meet William. William is four years old, and uh, according to a recent article, one morning at four o'clock in the morning, William came into his dad's room, woke his dad up, and said, Daddy, I need the iPad. Need. <laughs> well, thankfully, Dad marched William back to bed and told him that what he really needed was to go back to sleep. But at 7 a.m., when Dad woke up, he found that his iPad, which had been in his room, was now missing. And he found William in the living room playing a game on his iPad, the battery level indicating he'd been playing that game for over two hours. And this wasn't the first time that William had been exhibiting such symptoms. Later that day, as his parents considered his actions, they realized that William had become an iPad addict. Now you're saying, a what? iPad addict? I've heard of drug addicts, I've heard of tobacco addicts, but iPad addict? Indeed, we have now added a new category to the Diagnostic Manual for Addictions, tech addictions. Addictions just as strong as any drug addiction and it's affecting children as young as four years of age. A recent uh, article in the Telegraph was published titled, Toddlers are becoming so addicted to iPads they require therapy. Children as young as four are becoming so addicted to smartphones and iPads they require psychological treatment. And William is not the only one. This article in the Telegraph was mentioning a four-year-old girl from the UK who had to be treated for her addiction to the iPad. Dr. Richard Graham began the UK's first technology addiction program a few years ago, and he says that this little girl and William are not isolated cases. He said there are many more addicts of this young age. And furthermore, he says that young technology addicts have experienced the same withdrawal symptoms as alcoholics or heroin addicts when the devices were taken away. And so to get their kids unaddicted, Parents are paying Dr. Graham's clinic nearly $20,000 for a 28-day digital detox, as it's called. I think there are cheaper ways. <laughs> but you're saying, well, okay, one more uh, point I'd like to make. Dr. Nicholas Kadaras, one of the elite addiction specialists in the United States, this man has done some incredible research, and he says, I have worked with hundreds of heroin addicts and crystal meth addicts and what I can say is that it's easier to treat a heroin addict than a true screen addict. Easier to treat a heroin addict than a true screen addict. That is frightening. <laughs> that, is, uh, that should be grabbing our attention there. But maybe you're saying, my child is really not addicted. We're not dealing with this. I keep it well limited. I hope so. But perhaps we should consider what constitutes an addiction. As I looked at the symptoms of tech addiction, I had to question my own device usage. One of the first things we see is actual physiological withdrawal symptoms. Just like a, uh, uh, a person taking off drugs, you see the same thing happening in a child being taken off of, me of, of a media addiction. If your child is irritable, anxious, sad, whatever, having a device taken away, good indication. They may be pushing toward an addiction, may not be a full out addiction, but they may be pushing that direction. Tolerance is one, an, another thing that we often see. A child that maybe enjoyed it for five minutes and now they need 10 minutes and then they need an hour and then they need three hours, just like a drug addict, constantly needs stronger and stronger hits to be satisfied. A loss of interest in other activities. Children who once loved playing soccer and climbing trees or whatever, playing outside, and now they want to abandon those in favor of screen-based activities, another indicator that they may be pushing toward addiction. A lack of control. Now, four-year-olds are not famous for self-control, <laughs> but if we see a child who is just unable to control their usage, again, an indicator of possible addiction. Deception. This is one we see a lot. A child wants to hide how much or they deny how much they're actually using it. And uh, again, indicator of addiction. A means of escaping reality, and this is one I've seen a lot in my own research. You have a child who faces a stressful situation 
disagreement, argument of some kind, whatever it may be, they resort to a screen-based activity, the iPad, the smartphone, whatever it is. And losing opportunities is another one, similar to a loss of interest in other activities. They, they lose out on important things simply because of their interest in the screen. I think these symptoms uh, of tech addiction, and, and I actually go through each one of these and explain it very well in the DVD series, I child. So if I move too fast on that, you'll have to just watch it there because there's many other points I want to get to in the short hour that we have. Um, but I think these symptoms of tech addiction may be more uh, common than we'd like to admit. I, again, I questioned my own usage as I looked at this. So whether or not we are all out addicted or not, or our children are all out addicted, I think it raises some very important questions. You know, Technology is so very addicting, it's just as addicting as drugs or alcohol, as we've seen. So why don't they allow children to have drugs or alcohol? Why is there an age, I assume in New Zealand here, you have an age at which you're allowed to use certain substances, am I correct? Alcohol and drugs and things, yes? Okay. Uh, why do they limit it for children, though? Why don't they let children have it? Well, they assume that because of the development of the frontal lobe, that uh, when a person reaches... For us in the U.S., it's 21 years old to have alcohol. When you reach that age, your frontal lobe has developed enough for you to be able to limit your use. Now, I am by no means advocating that. <laughs> I believe we, we shouldn't be using those substances, of course. But they assume that adults with a more developed frontal lobe can limit their usage. Um, so that's why it's not given to children. So if we have something that's so powerfully addicting, I'm not suggesting that we can totally eliminate it from children's lives, but that should make us think about giving them, without the well-developed frontal lobe, something that is so powerfully addicting. You know, they might not have the ability to control their usage as well. But perhaps you're asking, what are the current recommendations? What does the research say about when a child should be allowed to have technology? Well, that's hard to say because it depends on who you ask. <laughs> Back in the TV days, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended no screen time until the age of two years old. Well, Dr. Christakis, who was with uh, Seattle Children's Hospital, um, has gone a year later and said no screen time until the age of three. But Dr. Christakis is not the only voice, and in fact, many others have urged keeping kids screen free into much later ages, like seven, eight, or even 12. Dr. Chris Rowan, who is a pediatric occupational therapist, recently published an article titled 10 Reasons Why Handheld Devices Should Be Banned for Children Under the Age of 12. She's actually arguing that it be made illegal for a child to have uh, a device under the age of 12. Now, obviously, this generated some serious controversy, <laughs> as you can imagine. And um, so as I looked at the various points that others were bringing in, saying, oh, she just went too far, and I said, yeah, but what were the points that Dr. Rowan brought out? What were the reasons she gave? And as I looked at them, I said, she's absolutely right. Um, I'll just touch on a few of them. The first one she names is that of rapid brain growth. We know that the child's brain explodes in development during the first two years of life. It triples in size and continues throughout early age, and we know that the child's development of the brain is dependent on the environment they are given. Whatever environment they're in is going to mold how their brain develops, and so if we place them in the media environment, it's going to affect the way their brain develops. And uh, what's even worse than that, though, is that the areas of the brain that help control spirituality, cause to affect reasoning, emotion, relationships, behavior management, language, memory, moral understanding, conscience, and character development. Pretty important list, right? Do you want children deficient in any of these areas? Definitely not. What's so significant about this list? The areas of the brain that control each one of these functions, the foundation is laid in the first seven years of a child's life. And so, the mother, really, the parents, are the best ones to be culturing the, and developing things in a child. But what do we do? We give them a media babysitter. Is media going to help them learn these things very well? Typically not. Delayed development, another one mentioned. Because of movement being very critical for development, as a child sits and is more sedentary in life, uh, we start to see uh, delayed development. And in fact, one in three children that enter school now are developmentally delayed, often physically developmentally delayed. 
Uh, we found that this study in the Journal of Medicine and Sport found that lower levels of moderate to, fi moderate to vis vigorous physical activity, higher levels of sedentary time, and particularly their combination were related to poor reading skills in boys. So again, just a connection there. The more sedentary they were, the poorer the reading skills. And there are a whole lot more studies we could look at there. But move on to uh, Dr. Rowan's third point, and that is obesity. They did a meta-analysis, which is an analysis of many studies, and compiled the results of 173 studies over a period of 30 years. Major research project. 86% of the studies found a statistically significant relationship between increased media exposure and an increase in childhood obesity. And it didn't have as much to do with the sedentary time. In fact, we don't really fully understand uh, what the connections are. It can, it's part the sedentary time, lower metabolic rate, um, but partly what they're viewing on the media. There are many factors involved, but 86% of them found a, a relationship between that. Sleep deprivation, another reason that Dr. Rowan gave, and this goes almost without saying, <laughs> with the, the number of hours that children are spending in media, they're obviously not going to be getting enough sleep. But we needn't do the math ourselves. A study out of Boston College found that approximately, now notice these numbers, 75% of children are sleep deprived. Okay, 75% of children, that's, that's a major problem. But what's interesting is, um, I don't think coincidental, that about 75% of children are allowed television or other forms of technology in their bedrooms. 75% sleep deprived, 75% with technology in their bedrooms. Maybe a connection. <coughs> Mental illness was another one named. Aggression, attention deficit disorders, I'll get to more of that in a moment. Addictions, we've already seen. Radiation emission, we know the World Health Organization has classified cell phones as a possible carcinogen due to radiation emission, and we know that children may be even more sensitive to this than adults. Some very important points she's named here, some very good points. So what are the current recommendations? Well, it does depend on who you ask, but if you ask Dr. Rowan and other top researchers, you'll be eliminating it, limiting or eliminating it for children under the age of 12. How's our scale looking right now? Getting a little weight on the damages side, are we not? Still some benefits, yes, but we're seeing some significant damages. Point number three, health risks. And again, they did a major study, 173 studies compared over a period of 30 years uh, to see what the health risks were with media. And I go into it in great detail in the iChild series, but to put it in a bulleted list, they found connections with childhood obesity, tobacco use, drug use, alcohol use, lower academic achievement, earlier sexual behavior, attention deficit disorders, and hyperactivity, all connected to media use early in childhood. Point number four, and this one is a major issue, eye damage. 65% of Americans are currently reporting symptoms of digital eye strain. And uh, the Vision Council actually reports about 75% of the younger generation experiencing digital eye strain. Screens are damaging for the eyes, and, and there are many reasons for that. It's bad for adults, but it's even worse for children because of the developing eyes that we talked about this morning. I mentioned this this morning, that the rate of nearsightedness in the U.S. has increased 66% since the 1970s. Major increase. What else has increased since the 1970s? Technology. They're using way more now than they used to. We also saw that children who spend less time outside are at greater risk of developing myopia. Part of the reason for that is less of uh, the bright sunshine they're getting outside. It's more time looking at things that are close up. The screen is more close up than the distant objects. We talked about all that in the development of the eye this morning. But there's something even more deadly to the eye, and that is something known as blue light. Blue light is uh, a major component of the screens we look at. And you say, well, I look at red things. <laughs> it's not necessarily the color of the object you're looking at. It's the, the component, what the light is made out of that is being emitted by your screen. Uh, to understand this, let's understand how light exists. We know that light, visible light exists on a spectrum of color. We have red light at the end, and that's low energy light, a longer wavelength. As we get up toward the blue, the wavelength of the light gets shorter and it becomes high energy, HEV as it's called. And um, <clears throat> past the blue, we get into ultraviolet light. And uh, obviously we see the ex 
effects of that every time we go outside and we get ourselves a sunburn. <laughs> Ultraviolet light is very high energy, it's short wavelength, creating uh, a, a damaging effect to your skin. And of course, it would have a very damaging effect to your eyes if they were exposed to it too much. But the Lord has designed our eyes to have an incredible filter on them. Uh, about 99% of ultraviolet light that we experience from the sun is filtered by our eyes. People have been living without sunglasses for thousands of years, and their eyes haven't been ruined. <laughs> Sunglasses are not bad, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying they're not necessary because our eyes have natural filters in them. And uh, what happens, though, is as we look at our, our uh, spectrum of light, though, on this side, to the le your left, of the blue, is ultraviolet light. But as we get just into the visible light spectrum, that is what our screens have a high proportion of. But the filters in our eyes are no longer activated when we're in that visible light spectrum. And so all this blue high-energy light is bypassing the filters and it's going right to the retina. The light from our devices is short wavelength enriched, meaning that it has a higher concentration of what's called blue light than natural light. The problem is that blue light penetrates all the way to the retina, which is the inner lining at the back of the eye. Laboratory studies have shown that too much exposure to blue light can damage the light sensitive cells in the retina. This causes changes that resemble those of macular degeneration, which can lead to permanent vision loss. <coughs> Excuse me. Compare that, I mean, combine that with screens being up close, and you've got a deadly combination for the eyes. And I probably don't have to explain that this is only going to make the problem worse. <laughs> Let me clarify, though, that not all blue light is bad. Sunlight has a lot of blue light in it. And we know that this type of light helps with alertness, mood, cognition, memory, and most importantly, it's very important for maintaining the body's circadian rhythm, which is another problem. When we have our screens with a high enriched amount of blue light, that's going to be affecting the circadian rhythm also. What happens as we lay in bed and we're looking at our screens for hours before we try to go to sleep? major problems involved there. In fact, blue light affects the levels of the sleep-inducing hormone melatonin more than any other wavelength. Healthy sleep patterns and deep sleep in particular are dependent on normalized circadian cycles and adequate melatonin secretion, which is suppressed by both screens and man-made EMFs. Deep sleep is essential for critical thinking, focus, memory, and mood. Very important areas, and we're damaging that because of using screens that is affecting the circadian rhythm. So you're saying, well, uh, isn't this affecting adults and not just children? It does. It absolutely is affecting us as adults. I've made it a habit as someone who, by necessity, must spend a fair bit of time in front of the screen. I try to do my computer work in the morning where I know it won't affect the circadian rhythm as much. If I have to work on it at night, I have a blue light filter. Most devices have that built in or you can get apps that will do that. Uh, to help filter the amount of blue light, there is sort of an amber filter that covers it and cuts down on the blue light. Doesn't totally eliminate it, but it definitely helps and won't affect the circadian rhythm as much. Point number five, interactive media. A lot of parents tell me when I talk about media that, yeah, you know, this doesn't apply to us because we got rid of the TV. <laughs> I say, well, great. Good to hear you got rid of the TV. But there are problems also with interactive media. And in fact, what we're finding now is interactive media is like television on steroids. It's making the problem even worse than television used to. And in fact, a recent study came out by uh, Dr. Victoria Dunkley, who, which was titled, Interactive Screen Time is Worse Than TV. I read that and I said, whoa, that sure caught my attention. <laughs> interactive screen time, which is supposedly the good form of media use because you can interact with it. It helps you learn and, and all these reasons given for educational media. Screen time, ed, interactive screen time worse than TV. So essentially, Dr. Victoria Dunkley is a pediatric psychiatrist and uh, she's done extensive work over many years with children having various problems. And she said, back in the day when they were just watching TV, I would take away the TV and the problems I was trying to fix would disappear. She said, more often than not, than not, I didn't have to do any sort of treatment program. They just, the problems disappeared when I took the television away. Fascinating. She said, but now we don't have television only. We have the iPad and the smartphone and the computer and on down the list of all these sort of things that interactive screen time that children are involved in. So 
she realized she had to take those away too. Treatment program continues to work. But she said, you know what, let's do a comparison study. So she would take children and uh, remove the television, but left the interactive screen time. Treatment program did not work. Just, just didn't have any effect. The screen time, the interactive screen time was causing the same problems the television used to. But then she did something else very interesting, and she took the interactive screen time away, but told them it was okay to watch television. The treatment program worked. If even a small amount of interactive screen time remained outside of school, the intervention would not work. She's done clinical observations on hundreds of patients. The typical overstimulated, impulsive, hyper-aroused kid on screens, seen any of those kids? <laughs> the dramatic changes in mood, focus, and compassion, capacity while off of them, even if TV was allowed, and the setbacks that occurred when the handheld devices returned. She also found that just 30 minutes of either computer use or gaming caused disturbed sleep and daytime fatigue, which is incidentally very uh, connected with ADHD. Just 30 minutes of computer use or gaming caused disturbed sleep and daytime fatigue compared to two hours or more of TV required for similar effects. You had to sit down and watch television for two hours to get the same effect that you would get from computer use or gaming. Again, the computer use and the gaming is like television on steroids. How? Why? She explains it well. The very interactiveness, the part that we think is good, is overly stimulating to the nervous system, especially a developing one, via sensory and circadian reactions and psychological and physiological hyperarousal. Once the arousal stress cycle becomes chronic, it will eventually cause damage to the nervous system. Now, notice what she says. Mere moderation of screen time is often not sufficient to interrupt this vicious self-perpetuating cycle. I hear it all the time. I'll limit how much my children use. I'll make sure they don't use too much. She says mere moderation won't do it. If you're having an issue that is connected to screens, mere moderation, just doing some, is not going to interrupt the cycle. Very interesting. Uh, moving quickly here. Dr. Jane Healy, I mentioned her um, in the first message that I gave on a thinking generation. She's done extensive research on media use, and again, I don't have time to explain all of it, but I'll mention some of the points that she names. Uh, through her research, she's found that media often overstimulates children, which we saw as a problem. The overstimulation was not a good thing, and creates a passive withdrawal. It causes attention and listening problems. It emphasizes skills which do not transfer well to reading or listening. Requires less mental effort than reading. Obviously, we don't want to condition children to an environment that requires less mental effort than reading, or pretty soon they won't be enjoying and have the attention for reading. It also shortens the time children are willing to spend on intellectual problems that they are set to solve. We're decreasing problem-solving time artificially manipulates the brain into paying attention. I'm going to get to more of that later, but notice she's saying it's forcing them to pay attention, essentially. How? By violating its natural defenses with frequent visual and auditory changes. The quick flashes, bright colors, sudden noises, the things they're experiencing in the media is actually violating the brain's natural defenses of danger, stimulating the brain to say, hey, this is scary, I better do something about it, and yet they're sitting there doing nothing. It's confusing the brain. And uh, we, we see some issues with that, as I'll get to in a moment. It induces neural passivity, and we definitely don't want our brains doing nothing, right? Neural, referring to the brain cells, passivity, doing nothing. Neural passivity, it induces that and reduces the brain's ability to remain actively focused on a task. And lastly, it has a hypnotic and possibly neurologically addictive. Now, she says possibly. This book was written a few years ago. We now know it positively is neurologically addictive effect on the brain by changing the frequency of its electrical impulses in ways that block active mental processing. And again, it's not just television, it's other forms of media too. The research she did was more focused on television. We have modern research to show that uh, it still applies with interactive media. Notice though, this word hypnotic, I hear it from parents a lot. They're like, hang on, you just took away my best babysitter. <laughs> Nothing holds my attention like the iPad. And I'm like, you're absolutely right, because it's designed to do that. It is engineered to be hypnotic and to hold your child's attention. 
We shouldn't be asking the question whether it holds their attention, but whether it's good that it's holding their attention. Maybe a babysitter, but it's not good for them. So how's our scale looking right now? A little heavy on the damages, is it not? (laughs) We have been uninformed, and that's just the point I want to make there, as the point as what we've just seen. um, The tech companies aren't really telling us all these effects, are they? They're just telling us how beneficial it is for us. And in fact, that's the next point I want to look at, and that is our second session in the iChild series called Uneducated. In the discussion about media, the most common argument given in favor of children's media use is its educational value. And for sure, kids can learn some great things from educational media, but just as in the other points we saw, we need to ask, are there side effects to this? There is a school district in Arizona, in the United States, called the Kyrene School District. And in a recent study, a recent article published called In Classroom of the Future, Stagnant Scores. You see, Kyrene School District in Arizona has decided they are going to be innovative. And since 2005, they have uh, spent nearly $33 million on educational technology in their school district, with an additional $45 million slated for the budget in educational technology. Incredible amount of money they're spending. So if anywhere should be seeing some gains from educational technology, it ought to be Kyrene School District, right? That would make sense. So how's it going? Well, since 2005, the date which they started implementing educational technology, scores in reading and math have stagnated in Kyrene, even as statewide scores have risen. It's not helping them at all, according to the test scores. David K. Schauer, who is the uh, Kyrene District Superintendent, was asked uh, about how's it going? You've spent a lot of money, taxpayers' money, (laughs) incidentally. And he said, he was asked, you know, how's it going? Are you seeing some benefits from this, this millions and millions of dollars you've spent? He says, quote, my gut is telling me we've had growth but we have to have some measure that is valid and we don't have that. I'm pretty sure my gut telling me something is not reason enough to spend $33 million. Now, to be sure, test scores can go up and down for many reasons. Maybe that's not the only factor here, but around the country, around the world, really, schools are spending billions of dollars on technology while there's little proof to say that it is actually helping. And in fact, they did a study, a $10 million study, no doubt funded by taxpayers, of 15 educational software products that is the most federal study yet to, cons- yet to follow methods that the U.S. Department of Education considers scientifically rigorous. A $10 million study looking at whether educational media is benefiting schools. What did they find? I quote from the study. No difference in academic achievement between students who use the technology in their classrooms and youngsters who used other methods. No difference, no benefit. Another study in 2009, a review by the Education Department of Research on online courses, which more than 1 million K-12 students are taking, found that policymakers lack scientific evidence of their effectiveness. Much educational software is not an improvement over textbooks. No benefits so far, according to the data. Now, Tom Vander Ark used to work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He is now an investor in educational media and educational software companies. This is what he does for a living, invests in software companies, educational software companies, so that he can make money. Now, if you were investing in something and somebody came up to you and asked you about the product that you were investing in, Would you say, ah, no, you know, it's not very good. You probably shouldn't buy it. (laughs) Would you say that if you were investing in it? No, likely you would talk it up. You would try to sell them on it because the more products you sell, the more money you make as an investor. Well, Tom Vanderark, the guy investing in a lot of educational software, was asked that question. How's the educational software companies doing? Uh, Is this beneficial for children? Is this a good thing to be investing in? I quote, the data is pretty weak, It's very difficult when we're pressed to come up with convincing data. That was the best he could say for the software he was investing in. Scientific research has been done across the spectrum of media use in schools, and with one consistent answer, it is not helping. In another study, they found that the more technology 
was used to teach a particular course, the fewer the students who felt they were able to actually get something out of the course. This was done at the university level also. I find it interesting. There is a school system, uh, I was going to say in the U.S., but it's actually all over the world, uh, called Waldorf schools. Now, these schools have some bad ideas. I'm not saying, I'm not here advocating Waldorf schools, but they have a very interesting policy, and that is a play and practical-based learning environment with no media. They say that children should be involved in play, in artistic work, songs, games, stories, outdoor time, practical tasks, cooking, cleaning, and gardening. These are all things that they do in their school. Sounds kind of like a good homeschool, doesn't it? <laughs> and in fact, they say that the classroom is intended to resemble a home with tools and toys usually sourced from simple natural materials that lend themselves to imaginative play. How beautiful. But they have something even more, and that is a no media use policy until the age of eight, uh, sorry, until eighth grade. No media use. So how's it going for Waldorf schools? Very well, actually. Most of their students go on to prestigious universities. Uh, and some of the top students around the world comes from Waldorf schools. The backward students who haven't learned how to use technology that supposedly is helping them learn so much. <laughs> And in fact, what's even more interesting is that there are an unusually high number of these schools in and around the Silicon Valley, the place where all the big tech CEOs live. Why? Because they're sending their children to Waldorf schools. The main reason is that these schools don't use educational technology. The chief technology officer of eBay sends his children to a nine-classroom school in the Waldorf School in the Peninsula, so do employees of Silicon Valley giants like Google, Apple, Yahoo, and Hewlett-Packard. Alan Eagle, who's a computer scientist and executive communications at Google, says, I fundamentally reject the notion that you need technology aids in grammar school. The idea that an app on an iPad can better teach my kids to read or do arithmetic, that's ridiculous. Chris Anderson, CEO of 3D Robotics, says, My kids accuse me and my wife of being fascist and overly concerned about tech, and they say that none of their friends have the same rules. That's because we've seen the dangers of technology firsthand. I've seen it in myself, and I don't want that to happen to my kids. What about Steve Jobs, the one who invented the iPad, the one that's so good for educational learning? The iPad has you know, revolutionized education now. He was asked, what do your kids think about the new iPad? He replied, well, they haven't used it. We limit how much technology our kids use at home. <laughs> Alan Eagle, the one who um, says, I reject the notion of, uh, that an app can teach my kids better than a teacher, is quoted as saying that his daughter does not even know how to use Google, and she's a fifth grader. But then he was asked, well, what are your children going to do when they grow up? How will they ever learn to use technology? I quote, it's super easy. It's like learning to use toothpaste. <laughs> at, <laughs> at Google and all these places, we make technology as brain dead easy to use as possible. There's no reason why kids can't figure it out when they get older. Brain dead easy, he says, from the scientist <laughs> at Google. One of the Waldorf School students was asked uh, what they thought about this no media environment. And interestingly, he responded quite positively. And he said, being able to think creatively and imagination are much more important than just being able to know how to Google something. Good point he's got there. When it comes to educational media, though, we begin to see attention deficits. Uh, obviously, you need to be able to pay attention to be able to learn well. We see attention deficit disorders on the rise. How, what's the connection? Is there a connection between media use and attention deficit? Absolutely, positively is a connection. If we define attention, it is defined as a concentration of the mind on a single object or thought. Question though, is educational media typically a single object or thought or many objects or thoughts? It's typically many. Most educational media bombards children constantly changes and new things because it's trying to hold their attention and that's precisely the problem it is designed to hold attention a child's ability to stay focused on a screen though not anywhere else is actually characteristic of an attention deficit hyperactivity disorder the reason for that is what dr healy puts as she says that the long-term outcomes of notice the underlying part forcing children's attention unnaturally 
Something else is holding the attention for them. Most children's programs are programmed. They're planned with an eye to capitalizing on the involuntary responses of the brain to movement and activity. It's how we're hardwired. And so what happens is, to put it in a nutshell, as children are conditioned to having something else hold their attention, they lose the power to hold attention for themselves. Does that make sense? Real life just doesn't grab you like media does. I mean, washing dishes is just not nearly as exciting as playing a computer game. <laughs> and as they become accustomed, as the children become accustomed to the unreal environment of the screen, pretty soon real world does not appear quite so interesting. As they're engrossed in media, pretty soon books, study, and school are no longer interesting. On top of that, as Dr. K Dimitri Christakis puts, he said, well, okay, yeah, this is related to it. I'll get to another point in just a moment. In the last 50 years, we've created platforms in which we present things in surreal time. You realize that when you watch something on television or uh, some sort of educational program, things happen a lot faster than in real life. And so you're presenting it in surreal time, unreal time. When you condition the mind to become accustomed to high levels of input, there's a chance that reality can just become boring. I'm going to skip to this part right here. When children report non-screen activities as boring, this should be a red flag to parents and educators that the child has become accustomed to an unnatural level of stimulation. There's another point to this educational media aspect, though, and that is Dr. Jennings Bryant, who has served on the research and planning committee for some of the best and top educational software programs in the world. He says, we work so hard to grab the child's attention that sometimes I'm afraid we forgot the learning. We may have created a child who was so reinforced to go after the excitement and the rewards that the learning was almost secondary. I think of a computer program that my grandma, who is a teacher, had when I was a child um, and it was some sort of educational program that if you got enough right answers, you got to play a little game. It was something with a mouse and cheese and helping the mouse not get caught. I don't remember the whole story. I was just a very little kid at the time. But I find it interesting, though, as I thought back on that recently, I realized that I could not remember what I was supposed to be learning from that computer game. I, I really don't know what the subject was. I suspect it was math, as my grandma's a math teacher, but I don't know. But what did I remember? the game I got to play. <laughs> that impacted me more than the learning. And of course, my grandma thought I was learning great. I was getting all the right answers. I could play this, but the reason I was getting all the right answers is I was motivated to be able to go play this game. We, we made the learning almost secondary. Many more studies connected to attention deficit disorders. I don't have time to get into them all. The Common Sense Media did a study and found 69% of studies report a statistically significant relationship between increased media exposure and ADHD and other attention problems. The Journal of Pediatric Psychiatry found a connection. The American Academy of Pediatrics is saying it's connected to ADHD. Dr. Dimitri Kostakis. Uh, everydayhealth.com published an article, Psychology Today, uh, Victoria Dunkley. The, the, the research is almost unlimited on the connection between media and attention deficit disorders. And as Herman Maurer put it so well, we are headed toward a global attention deficit syndrome, if we're not already there. <laughs> but there's more, and that is something known as digital dementia. Now, obviously, part of learning is being able to remember what you learned, right? Well, we're starting to see something in young people known as digital dementia. Actual physiological changes in the brain exactly the same as dementia that we would see, or Alzheimer's essentially, not, not exactly, but dementia that we would see in older people. It's called early onset digital dementia as opposed to late onset dementia. Uh, South Korea has the highest smartphone ownership and media use out of any country in the world, and they are currently experiencing a deterioration in cognitive abilities that is more commonly seen in people who have suffered a head injury or psychiatric illness. 15% of the population, the teenage population, is exper experiencing this uh, effect. Frightening, really. 15% in South Korea and 14%, according to a study, in the U.S., 14% of young people between 18 and 39 complaining of memory problems. 
What's happening? Well, individuals who rely heavily on technology may suffer deterioration in cerebral performance such as short-term memory dysfunction. And many children don't memorize anything because they can Google it. That's to put it in a very tiny nutshell. There's a lot more on the DVD series, but uh, quite a frightening phenomenon we're seeing there. I definitely don't want to be encouraging dementia in myself. Brain imbalance and right hemisphere damage is another one we're seeing. Overuse of the smartphones and game devices, according to a doctor in South Korea, is hampering the balanced development of the brain. Heavy users are likely to develop the left side of their brains, leaving the right side untapped or underdeveloped. Uh, now, we also know that it damages the left hemisphere. We know that it damages the frontal lobe. It's damaging a lot of areas of the brain, but this doctor has focused his research on its damage on the right side of the brain. Now, what happens if we have right hemisphere damage? It's a f quite a scary thing, actually. We begin to see patients with difficulty with paying attention. Are we seeing that in young people? Definitely. Perception, learning, memory, organization, insight, orientation all from right hemisphere damage. We also see poor social communication, difficulty with recognition and expression of emotion, and difficulty with reasoning and problem solving, all from right hemisphere damage. We definitely don't want to be running the risk here of damaging the right hemisphere with overuse of smartphones, as this doctor is telling us. But what's even more frightening is, as I mentioned this morning, that the frontal lobe, sorry, the, the, well, the frontal lobe is also, but the right hemisphere is very influential in spiritual strength and spirituality in a person. Does the devil know what he's doing here? I think he's up to something. Getting us so involved in technology, we're running the risk of damaging our frontal, uh, sorry, our right hemispheres, which is possibly damaging spiritual strength. But there's more even more serious, anterior cingulate cortex damage, ACC for short. The anterior cingulate cortex, this yellow area here, located in the frontal lobe of the brain, deals with impulse control, decision-making, emotion, controlling emotional responses, attention, motivation, and notice the last two things here, error detection and the center of the free will. Do you think that's important for Christians to have? Damage to the ACC can result in OCD, PTSD, depression, addictions, including drug addictions, poor emotional regulation, poor motivation, neuroticism, sensation seeking, and impulsivity. Why am I bringing out this important area of the brain? A recent study found that something known as media multitasking, using more than one form of media at the time, at one time, which we do all the time. We watch something and quickly turn to our smartphones and then we're back on our computers or we're Googling something and, oh, look at that article, copy, paste, switching screens, oh, let's try another search term, try that page, nope, let's go back to that one. Constant media multitasking, just bombarding ourselves with an overload of media. Uh, and what they found is that higher media multitasking activity is associated with smaller gray matter density in the anterior cingulate cortex. Now, just to clarify here, smaller gray matter density is not a positive thing. <laughs> if we're talking about a br an important brain area, we don't want to be decreasing the size of that brain area. The study revealed a significant relationship between media multitasking and brain structure variations. Individuals who reported higher amounts of media multitasking had smaller gray matter density in the ACC. Heavier media multitaskers had smaller ACC volumes. And I'm going to skip over a lot of this and just focus on the part in the white there. The ACC is generally thought to be involved in error or conflict detection. Critical for a Christian to have detecting the errors in the last days. Again, the devil knows what he's up to here, damaging our brains with our media use. Have we seen enough already? We've seen some pretty solid reasons why educational media may not be actually all that educational and why it may be damaging children's brains in the process. In the last few minutes that we have, I'd like to turn our attention to a quick overview of the last disc on the iChild series, and that is what I've called Unreality. As a brain researcher, this was actually what stimulated my interest in this topic, and that is as I knew how important the environment of a child was, and I knew that whatever the environment was, it was going to be impacting how a child learned and developed and how their brain grew, I knew that we had a situation where there's the screen, how it is now, versus reality, real life. The screen is not real life. How is that impacting children? 
A study found that children learn to tie shoelaces later than ever before. Today's children now learn how to operate complex technology long before they know how to tie shoelaces. Do you remember learning how to tie your shoe? <laughs> I do. And they're learning later than ever before. We are separating children from real life. And I have a lot of examples of that in the DVD. But to, to just touch on some quick points, we're damaging a child's sense of reality. Because children develop their sense of what's real and what isn't between the ages of 3 and 10. If they're exposed to reality-blurring imagery during that key developmental stage, it compromises their ability to discern reality. This talks about how children who are passively stimulated by a glowing screen don't have to do the neural heavy lifting, the brain lifting, to create those images. In other words, we have pre-baked creativity. As a child is exposed to whatever's on the screen, somebody's already thought that for them. Somebody's already created it for them, and they don't have to do the creating themselves. So we begin to see an overstimulated environment with media compared to the real world environment that is typically not overstimulating. It is attention grabbing and addicting compared to the real world that just doesn't grab your attention so well, as we've already seen. It's also not real world communication. As a shocking statistic that came out of a study done in Canada, that parents spend an average of 3.5 minutes per week participating in meaningful conversation with their children. Minutes per week. That is incredibly low. And of course, an electronic machine of whatever description does not engage in two-way conversation, which children need to become confident communicators. It's also not real-world interaction. Children need physical, dimensional, three-dimensional, real interaction versus the imaginary interaction on the screen. What's the solution? Well, let's think back to how childhood used to be. Back in the day, children played outside. They had plenty of physical exercise. They helped with the daily work inside and out. They learned by exploration. They experienced real life consequences. They learned with pencil, paper, textbooks, sorry, pencil, paper, textbooks, and a human teacher. Am I correct? Is this what childhood used to be? What's happened though? Well, we've pushed that aside. And now we have, instead of playing outside, they're playing on their smartphone or their tablet. Instead of getting physical exercise, they're living a sedentary, indoors, television-viewing lifestyle. Instead of helping with the daily work, the work is replaced by screen-based entertainment. Instead of learning by exploration, they're spoon-fed, pre-baked creativity. Instead of real-life consequences that when you break something, you have to fix it, when you drop something on your toe, it hurts, now you just press reset or control Z. No consequences felt. And instead of learning with the real life objects that they used to, we now have ebooks, interactive whiteboards, and educational games, which we've already seen are not benefiting learning. And yet the research shows that children who play outside are more fit and healthy, they have stronger immune systems, more active imaginations, they're more creative, reduce stress, lower anxiety, less aggressive and violent behavior, they have an increased attention span as opposed to the decreased one we saw with media, better cognitive functioning, whereas the fresh air gives them a stronger immune system and fewer allergies and lower incidence of asthma and improves oxygen flow flow to the brain. Sunshine provides vitamin D. It improves eye health instead of decreasing eye health that we have from the screens. It reduces the risk of diabetes and heart disease. It raises serotonin levels, positively affects sleep by adjusting the circadian rhythm and melatonin levels, unlike the screen, which is negatively affecting sleep. Real life, I mean, the Lord knew what he was saying when he said that children needed to spend out time outside in the open air, the, in, in nature, their textbook. What kind of mud do you want your child in? What kind of gardening do you want them doing? Useful work is beneficial. And remember that if your child can use a smartphone, they can easily operate any of the above. <laughs> but it's not just the children. I want us to also think about that. Many times, parents are allowing their own device usage to separate them from their important job of spending time with their children. Consider that also. What are some of the effects we've seen? Well, we saw that it was highly addicting. There are many health risks. There's eye damage. There's negative effects from blue light. The interactive media is often more damaging than television. Educational media is not helping. It's causing attention deficit problems. Uh, digital dementia we saw, actual brain damage there. 
brain imbalance and right hemisphere damage, anterior cingulate cortex in the frontal lobe, critical area of the brain, damage to that, overstimulating. It's not real world communication. It's not real world interaction. It's separating them from reality. How's our scale? I think it's pretty well tipped over toward the damages side, has it not? Major effects. Is it any wonder that we are told in the spirit of prophecy that the more quiet and simple the life of a child, the more free from artificial excitement, and the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable it is to physical and mental vigor and spiritual strength? <laughs> again, did God know what he was talking about? He absolutely did. And again, let's place our faith in what the Lord says. I believe we need to interject or inject this whole conversation, though, with a bit of common sense. I'll, I know someone's going to come up to me after this and say, hey, but media is so helpful. It's a good tool in our lives. And uh, I agree. It is a tool. We use it in our lives. But again, we need to consider the age at which the media use. Just because as an adult, we use it as a part of our work doesn't mean that it's necessary for the child. And also what can be damaging to, not damaging to an adult's mind may very well be damaging to a child's mind. And so there is a difference between the age at which um, we are using media and also let's just use some common sense. Instead of just snapping it all up and just inundating our lives with it, let's take an informed approach and do what we can to negate the harmful effects of media. Let's go back to reality, shall we? Let's close the prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the incredible insights and uh, research that we've seen. We thank you, Lord, for confirming our faith in the principle that a child should live that quiet and simple life free from artificial excitement. We thank you for your blessing and uh, the blessed day that we've enjoyed. We ask now for your blessing as we go and gain some rest, that we be well rested, awake refreshed in the morning to spend time with you, and we look forward to another blessing tomorrow. We thank you, and in Jesus' name we ask, amen.